up and running. Excellent. Welcome everyone to our Chaos, Diversity and Inclusion Working Group meeting. It's good to see you. I was just thinking, it would be nice if we can get back into the routine of rotating the uh, discussion leaders. Sure. We did that a while ago and the idea, I'm, I'm sure you remember. The idea is that at the end of the meeting or at some point we elect someone to send out a reminder before the meeting and then run the meeting. And we do have a different person every time. So let's I'll be see. honest, I'm in a situation where I can never run this meeting because I have another meeting that starts at 10 past the hour. So I usually have to leave about five past. So I always have to leave early. Yep. No, that's fine. We're still happy that you can join us for 40 minutes. <laughs> 35 minutes. Let's see. Last time we it was still before the meeting with angela so since last oh, yeah. time we had a meeting with angela and i think everyone on the call was actually part of this i was super happy with how that went by the way yeah <laughs> oh yeah so the, the we had an email on the mailing list with next steps um i don't think we need to go over it here unless there was something we needed to talk about and do um in terms of the meeting yes well the only thing that i wanted to say was actually there were two things one is i think we do need to be really careful with the data and we need to be very conscious of this and probably not everybody in dni will see the data and i think we have to be okay with that that reminds me we do have to give Angela a name of someone who will be the data contact person well that's just that's this yes exactly yeah so that's related to this so we so I think I was saying maybe to to Don but like universities are set up to do this we would have to submit an IRB protocol yeah. to actually work with this data. Um, so we do have an ethics board that takes a look at this data and we actually have to make a proposal to talk about how we would receive the data, you know, the whole routine and handle the data. Yep. Um, and the disclosure practices around the data. So, I mean, right out of the gate, I'd offer here at the university us to do that but um and i, mean, I think I, that makes sense personally i i would prefer to have have you do it over okay anyone and else I, I can as part of the irb i can have other people be part of the team that aren't necessarily here at the university so that is a possibility yeah so why don't um in that regard, then why don't I start setting up an IRB proposal to be able to do that? It, the only, the only, my only hesitation, I, I mean, I agree. I think the university is good, but it takes a little while. I may have some questions back and forth with the IRB. Yep. So, you know, you know, universities, <laughs> they're not lightning <laughs> quick. <laughs> but we could still have you talking to Angela now to talk about what kinds of data we might want, how how it could be delivered. Um, yes, I, I need like that, that kind of stuff because I need to get that yeah. in the, the proposal, the IRB proposal anyway. Okay, so I can be the point of contact. That's, and if anybody else would like to be part of that team, you need to let me know. So Daniel, we're talking about working with the Linux Foundation event data. And I'm gonna to put together an IRB protocol mm -hmm. proposal here, just because okay. universities are kind of set up to handle, as you know, yeah. the ethic, ethics, ethical issues around data. And if you would like to be part of the team or Georg or Don, Matt, you're here in the university, just let me know and I can include you on the proposal. Okay, thank you for the summary. Okay. 
Georg, did I get you raising your hand to be part of that? Yes, that's okay. exactly why. Okay. Okay. Okay, sounds good. And then the other thing is on the Linux Foundation stuff, um, I would really like to encourage uh, uh, the team at the Linux Foundation that if they're using the chaos metrics in the surveys that they somehow brand it a little bit in the surveys. So I don't know how what that would look like, but I think getting the chaos logo or the chaos brand as part of that would be a real big win for the work that all of you have done. Okay. Because to me, that's a huge, I mean, honestly, you, the, the work group has put together a bunch of metrics around event DNI. And I mean, to have an organization like the Linux Foundation actually deploying these metrics, <laughs> it really doesn't get much bigger than that mm -hmm. in terms of what you're proposing these metrics to have an impact. Yeah. So I don't know, you know, what other large organizations, there are obviously others that run events, but you know, that's, that's huge. I, hmm, I, I'm, I don't know how it will be done, but maybe as part of the question, we can have like parentheses chaos metric, um, and then a link to our definition. So, I was more just thinking like a, the logo at the beginning of the survey, you know, say in conjunction with the chaos mm -hmm. project, some of these questions have been developed or some of these questions have been developed in conjunction with the chaos project, particularly around event diversity inclusion and the logo. Okay. Yeah. That, that solves one of the issues I was thinking about when we, go the route that I was initially thinking with having a link in the questions going out of the survey to learn more about each question. Yeah, we, those people taking the survey. yeah then, we, then we out of band people and then they never come back. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So that I didn't like my thought, but your thought makes <laughs> much more sense. That's why they're just thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, having co-branding the surveys. Or just even a statement, like thanks to the cat, something, something really, I think it can be pretty low overhead. Don, does Kubernetes, do they run KubeCon or does the Linux Foundation run it? Do you know? Um, the Linux Foundation runs it. We have somebody specifically. Um, yeah, we have. I think there are a couple of people who from the Linux Foundation who are specifically kind of dedicated to CNCF events. Okay. But it is, it is run by the LF. Okay. Yeah, I, I put together a statement that we might be able to use something like some questions are inspired by the chaos metrics work an initiative to develop standardized metrics for the open source ecosystem learn more at chaos.community we might want to make the linux foundation stuff clear uh, a linux foundation initiative linux foundation project yeah Yeah. Maybe. Derived from, based on, really stronger language. Something like that.
I like derived from. Do we want or to use, developed by? Do we want to use the keyword help somewhere? <laughs> Maybe not. Sorry, what help? Uh, yeah, so as is in the acronym of chaos, so it's like a develops standardized health metrics or metrics, I know. I was trying to use the keyword health that typically people like. That, yeah, that no, term. I... Maybe something like this. Sounds good. Okay. Well, we have something we can uh, share with Angela. Um, when I reach out to Angela about the contact person, do you want me to include this now or is this something that we bring up later? I don't think it's a big request. I think you could include it now. Okay. I will include it then. Cool. Those are my two comments. So yeah, I'm super happy uh, that we are finally getting this work done. The other work that we have been doing in the last week or two is collecting DNI surveys in open source. And I had reached out to other communities and on Twitter. There's uh, feedback I still need to put in. And then uh, Daniel, I think um, you and Anita will probably take a deeper look at this for the Apache software. I think so. Mm -hmm. so is the goal to develop a survey that the ASF would run across their projects to identify DNI related issues at the project level, unlike the LF, which is more at the event level? Um, probably both levels. But okay. uh, the, the goal, I mean, the goal of the project is, is that thing. The goal of, I guess, collecting the DNI service in open source is to have them in chaos, which are two different goals, right? Say that latter one. I think Matt was asking about the goal of the ASF survey. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, in that case, yes. <laughs> it's to identify DNI related issues at the project mm -hmm. level. Yeah, the discussion I've had with uh, Anita has been specifically focused not about discovering diversity, uh -huh. but about discovering the perception of the people about how inclusive the community is. I see. You know, it's not about bringing the numbers that they, they have, that we are going to do this in somehow, not about the perception people have, which is, well, yeah, that's the main reason why we are having this service. Okay. Yeah. Mm. And when I was talking with Chris at the open source. Hey, Nicole. Good to see you. Good morning. <laughs> oh. When I was talking with Chris at the open source summit, she is very much interested at the project level. And she was even thinking about having a question at the top saying, hey, which project are you most involved with? And then please answer all following questions specific to your engagement with this project. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the ideas that we were talking about. Okay. So one of the questions that I have on this, is this similar to the work that Batergia has done with OpenStack? Or is this... Mm. No, in, in this case, it's, 
is, is different. So the goal, so the, the, the initial goal with OpenStack and the report was mostly focused on quantitative approach. And then we realized, well, there are other areas that we can, where we can retrieve information as, uh, you know, the website. So then we have the ambassadors or the technical leaders or similar yep. stuff. So it was more um, uh, like us going and pulling information from different data sources. Mm -hmm. In this way, we are asking the ASF community about what they think or they feel. Okay. Then we try to uh, cover certain areas and mostly focus on inclusivity perception. Well, I mean, the, the surveys are still, uh, they need to be designed and all of these things. So this is still a work in progress. But the, the goals are different. So in this case, most of the work is going to be qualitative from that point of view, asking people. While in the open stack was mostly quantitative, I would say. Okay, thanks. And of course, but whatever we learn, will bring that uh, will bring that back to chaos. So our idea is to, uh, you know, the survey or the results or what these things. Well, yeah, and I think a, a big a big takeaway would be the the actual survey itself, if that could be an open source product. In some, it's something we have to discuss with the, with the ASF, but I guess it should be. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> That's my point. Cool. Being able to see that survey and see the results then, I mean, really allowing other people to run that survey mm -hmm. for their own projects would be a, a, another really nice thing. But yeah. Chris is very much interested in the cross collaboration between our projects. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is that she is very much interested in inviting us to give feedback on the survey beforehand and to be part of it. Okay. Could you ask about like making the survey available, how the survey would be made available? I don't mean to, is it a private survey? Is it a so so the, everything, under creative commons? Uh, everything will be discussed on the, um, Apache Software Foundation mailing list, the dev at diversity.apache.org. Okay. So I highly recommend just joining this even mm -hmm. for a short time while this project is ongoing. Okay. And when I was talking with, well, one thing we still need to figure out is what license this will all be under. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the legal review that is currently ongoing. Okay at the Apache Software Foundation. Okay. But it, Chris wants it open source. Okay. So. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, so yeah, those are the two things two initiatives that um, we are driving forward right now. Um, the other thing we've been working on during the last meetings was um, the onboarding metric. So unless anyone else has anything they want to add, we can go and continue working on the onboarding metric. I'm good. Oh, there was a, in the, the open source diversity forum, there was a question about whether we would have chaos, diversity and inclusion talks at the uh, Boston. So one thing to think about is whether we can, or want to, or anyone wants to present at Boston in a dev room somewhere. I know the calls are not open yet, but just to seed the idea. Yeah, I think we should definitely keep a lookout for which dev rooms get accepted and see if they're anywhere it might be appropriate. Yeah. Well, that's uh, the hard thing about FOSM, until they accept the dev rooms, who knows? 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, let, so I know the deck room proposals were already due. Do we know when they released them? I think it was October, sometime in October, I think. Yeah. I wrote it down somewhere. Oh, Nicole, since you're on the call and yeah. down in the meeting minutes, you had wanted to work on a comprehension, no, comprehensive blog post about ChaosCon. Yes, I am. Um, so I am, it's taking me a little bit longer to get through the transcriptions. So I, <clears throat> yeah, I recorded all of the talks that, uh, were done at ChaosCon. Um, I'm still working through that. Uh, it's taking me a li little bit longer than I anticipated. But yes, um, I am working through that. I'm going to be transcribing the talks and then uh, working the transcriptions into, um, I don't know yet if it's going to be a single blog or if it will actually be multiple blogs. Um, and what makes sense there. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, um, I am still working on that. And just to note, the dev room should be announced on the 30th and the CFP is open in October. 30th okay. of September. So we have a week, next week, excellent. I yeah. Guess. If um, oh, go ahead. no, go ahead, Nicole. Um, if if I find that I've got meaty enough um, transcriptions of each of the talks um, to to make them separate blogs, that I I might actually find myself um, with with multiple blogs rather than just one. So I am. Um, I will let you know how that goes. Um, if you're looking for um, or interested in samples of um, what I've written before in terms of things like this, I've done some blogs like this for women who code Portland um, uh, for some of their networking nights. Uh, that I can point you to, <clears throat> um, but uh, I will let you know how it goes, but it actually could be more than one blog. Okay. Yeah, that's really cool. I look forward to it. Cool. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah. Um, on transcribing, I know transcribing takes a lot of work, and I don't know if you have a... It does. Yeah. I don't know if you have a budget to outsource it because um, there is a service that I used for my PhD work, oh. rep.com. Yeah, I use them for a bunch of Linux Foundation projects too. They're actually fantastic for technical stuff. Yeah. And you can either have a human verify the quality and it costs $1 per minute or you can even do an um, artificial intelligence where the quality is not quite as good, but it still saves you a lot of work. And I think it's 10 cents per minute or so. Oh, that'd be great. If you could point me to those resources, that'd be wonderful. Yeah. Because yeah, tr transcribe, I think transcribing them, like I've been doing it, um, uh, which is like you said, intensive. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you could point me to those resources, that would be great. Yeah. Um, if you go, are you in the meeting minutes or in the, do you see the chat? Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm in the both. So, yeah. I posted the, the link there for you. Oh, awesome. Perfect. Yeah. And 10 cents per minute, uh, that's $6 for an hour. Awesome, 
All right. Well, that th that was my advertising for today. <laughs> yeah, I do want to say that if you haven't seen it, uh, LWN.net posted my talk, an overview of my talk, and I put it in the minutes, and it actually largely highlighted a lot of the DNI stuff. So I used that as the base example. Yeah, I thought that was great. I retweeted it. Um, I thought that was fantastic. It would, so it's a little unnerving when you don't know that they're in the audience and then you see that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Glad I did okay. <laughs> yeah. Just so you know, Matt, we do um, have a website, a page on our website, the media page, and your article or the article that Kerner wrote is there already. Awesome. Although I see that the order got kind of mixed up because there were several multiple pull requests competing. I'll fix that. All right, that was it for that one. Okay. So, um, excellent. So shall we go on to issue 121, the last link in the meeting minutes and work on the document that is linked sure. there, the onboarding. And Don, I know you have to leave soon, so I just wanted to wish you a good afternoon. Thanks, you too. Have a good day. So in, when you open the Google Doc, I'm going to post the link also in the chat. On board. Just for convenience. Um, we had already the um, worked through the question and we decided to on the last one which because it was most similar to the ones we already have released then we already worked through the description and we worked through the objectives one of the comments last week was that this onboarding metric right now is under leadership. And the way we described it and the objectives we had, there's not a lot of leadership in them. So that was a conversation we had last week and we left it at wanting to just describe it how we understand it and then maybe we, put it somewhere else, and maybe there's a different metric that is specific to leadership. So I just wanted to recap the conversation we had last week. So did you have a, was there a discussion about where it would be in terms of a focus area, like project and community? Or? We did not arrive at a conclusion. We just raised the issue. Okay. And so the next sections to work on after, you can take a look at the description objectives just to recap, would be uh, success metrics and strategies. Okay. Everyone knows what to do now. If not, please do ask. So is the hope here is to ask like what these things are? Do you want us to work in the document or do you want us to talk through this? I would like us to work in the document and get it in a state where we can put it into a markdown and have it ready for the next release. That is the goal. And so today, yes, let's work through strategies and success metrics to have it in a clean state that we can publish. So is there a mapping? Could you help me remember again? Is there a mapping between strategies and success metrics? So we have the objectives above and then strategies are to hit those objectives and then the metrics are to address the strategies. Is that kind of so the way that I think of it, 
Yeah. These strategies are data collection strategies. Um, and this is basically a high level of below success metrics. So in the success metrics, we define what it is we are collecting and mm -hmm. how we are collecting it, when, where we are collecting it, and strategies is an overview of where we go for data. Kind of like these two here, like, um, sorry, but um, observing guidelines available on the website with respect to onboarding, interviewing people. Yeah. These are very reasonable strategies in that regard then. Your friction log, also has an entry down in the qualitative section. I don't know what a friction log is, but. A friction log is where you keep track of any issues you have. So it's a personal experience of someone trying to contribute. Mm -hmm. And to keep track of, okay, these are all the issues I ran into. Um, it's used in user interface design just to keep track of where the user interface is not working and have a have a contextual setting for it okay to help communicate with the engineering team and we can use friction lock also for community engagement so friction logs are things that I ask people to write. Yes. Okay. So is it like a diary? Basically, yes. So I tried to explain it down in the success metric. Okay. Do we want to be a bit more specific in the trace data? Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all, all trace data. <laughs> Everything. I, I, I was thinking when, so I was reading this and then I was reading the success metric. Uh, uh, where was this? Ah, conversion funnel, which is the first in the, in the list of quantitative ones that says, Find your contributor pathway and identify stages, measure convention, com conversion and attrition rate between stages. Uh, when doing certain analysis, we've realized that if you start aggregating like all of the data sources, whatever they are, uh, into one place, then you realize that there are some with a really high activity or higher activity in terms of events if you compare to others. Um, an example here would be that if we go for comments in issues versus um, commits, uh, probably the number of comments, if we aggregate everything, is going to be like uh, uh, 10x, one extra magnitude if you compare one to each other, or emails versus this kind of thing. So there are data sources that are uh, kind of telling us, hey, I have a really low barrier for entering and participating in this community. So I don't know how to write this down, but this is I feel in the trace data thing. So trace data that um, that that runs in on contributions from new members, commits. What was it? So I mean, at this point in the strategies, it can be pretty high level. Hmm. So. Based on what you just said, can you say it again? <laughs> um, so, so I, I agree with the trace data. The point is that if this is too generic, what can we do to have this more specific? And the way I see this might be more specific is to go directly. So an example to go to the each of the data sources and simply count uh, participation. Mm -hmm through commits or through contributions or whatever it might be. Yeah, emails, uh, messages in a Slack. Okay. And then if we, if we count all of these events, probably messages in a Slack or IRC channels is a really 
low barrier for anyone in the community. So, hey, it seems that for the onboarding, IRC channels may help better than directly asking for a pull request. And How about trace data about contributions during onboarding? Yeah. So an example, when we were doing the uh, mentorship analysis for the OpenStack uh, diversity project, um, people tend to have more activity in the mailing list yeah. than if compared to, to the commit activity. So it seems that participating in the mailing list is easier for any reason, or more verbose at least. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'm, what I'm hearing you say is that when looking at the data, one thing to be aware of is how different data sources mm -hmm. um, have different participation patterns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a good note to make somewhere. I don't think it changes the metric itself. It's just something to be aware of. Yeah. Maybe over here. So it's just to be a bit more specific about trace data. Is this, Danielle, is this, um, I'm, as we're discussing this, I'm reminded of my conversation with, uh, I don't remember her last name, Anita at mm -hmm. OSU at Oregon State University, mm -hmm. where she talked about, and I had the same experience, where she talked about students who, um, it was a barrier of entry for them. Um, they feel more comfortable mm -hmm. participating in an open source community Right, so in the context of onboarding, mm -hmm. they feel more, um, they, they feel um, more comfortable in participating uh, with tools who are with entry points that they're for, more familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the, the open source community, right, has language um, pull request or uh, commit or things like this that they may be, they, a new person, may be less familiar with uh, and, and maybe that is why a mailing list can be, why, why we're seeing more participation from newcomers because a mailing list is less, for lack of a better term, scary to them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's similar. Yeah, to why a Google Sheet was less scary to me, right? Where okay, I can do work with a Google Sheet. That's no problem. Mm -hmm. But oh my goodness, now you want me to use a, um, uh, you know. We need to get up to speed on all of the different tools used by the open source community. Mm. Does that make sense? Is that what you're trying to describe? Yep, basically. Um, the only point is that if we go for tracing data, then uh, I was looking for automated ways of tracing that data. But it's true that we can directly ask uh, newcomers for, uh, I know what you think is the easiest uh, 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 way you can help the community. And then for instance, in, in DNA, we have the Google Docs. So participating in a Google Doc is, seems to be quite straightforward and it's easier than if we need to ask people to go for a pull request. So then it's about, so if, if we, Imagine that we can trace activity in Google Docs. We imagine that we can trace activity in pull request. Given the changes that we have to do to all, the, all of the Google Docs, the comments and so on, most of us will have much more activity than in compared to in other data sources. So, yeah. Uh, right, okay. 
อย่างอย่างนั่นเองครับ so I guess uh, Georg that what we have now like collect trace data about contributions during onboarding should be enough okay uh, yeah if we go down to quantitative That's mm -hmm. where we can find the details. So, what we're specifically talking about that should be in this section down here on the quantitative. Mm -hmm. So, is there, is is this where you think we need more detail? And then, oh, by the way, if you go down a step below. There's notes, and I added the note about being aware of differences between platforms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, this under success metrics, that is where we need the detail level. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the conversion funnel is very fuzzy. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Um, I, I included in resources the link to Mike McQuake's um, work on this. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll put it up at the top as well. And so we, we have two options now. One is we go into the details on how to Do a conversion funnel, and the other option is we leave it as is until someone actually wants to implement it, and then we take that feedback to improve the metric later. Hmm. So my only comment here would be that um, this way of uh, collecting data about contributions during onboarding would be so we have this conversion funnel, which is this. Uh, Inverted pyramid. So basically, it would be like what are the two data sources on the top that are having that big attraction of of people to the community. So basically, those are the easier to, at least from my point of view, to participate at. So then, those are the ones that uh, may help to have this low barrier. Can you can you put that into writing? No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because. I, just listening and trying to process. It's sometimes easier for me to see if you just make the change you think we should make in the document. Yeah. Um, oh, and by the way, I think conversion funnel. We can create an entire metric just for this. It's a very composite metric that I think can stand on its own. So let me let me share. Uh, the the, the, I'm the idea of the conversion funnel is how do you convert newcomers to be active members in the project? Is that basically it? Yeah. Hmm. And to check at the different stages. Yeah. How many people are not being converted? Yeah, that seems super complex. Because I think, as Daniel was pointing out, at that widest part, there are certain things you probably want to look at. At the narrower, there are different things, and then yeah, mm. it's a whole series of. And then also, um, like being able to articulate that these metrics at these different levels are actually related to one another. That as people mm -hmm. step through different mm -hmm. stages, that's all part of that conversion funnel. That seems super complicated. Can you share my screen? Yes, you can. Yeah. Uh, let me show. So, yeah. So these are uh, some slides that we had at Inner Search Commons. Mm -hmm. um, so if you see this chart here, yeah, I mean, I see the figure, not the bottom right. So details real well. Each, each of the colors. Just imagine each of the colors are different data sources, whatever they are. And then we realize that in this specific project, we have this bunch of red activity, right? So it seems that that data source, whatever it is, uh, it's been really attractive for the community. 
and for perhaps newcomers. So we can have the similar stuff from newcomers. So the point is, if we have this big amount of participation and attraction here, it seems like something easy to participate, something easy to deal with. Mm -hmm. So is there, is this somehow helping in the onboarding process? So it seems that after a while, this data source has never been used after all, right? So it's like, hey, this is really trendy, blah, blah, blah. And then after a while, this disappears. But so uh, we're looking at here is, is this a single project over time? And then the different... Okay, it's just, oh yeah, so the, the x-axis is time, the y-axis are uh, contributors. As far as and the remember. colors are the different channels that they could yeah. participate different in. Different data sources. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is fake data, so, don't, so we don't think that much about this. But it's, yeah. it's that suddenly we can see like a big jump here, a big trend. So what's going on? And this is just counting people participating in each of the several channels that we may have for interaction. It's like if we, I don't know, open a Slack channel and suddenly we realize that the Slack was the need, mm -hmm. the, the thing we needed to have for, for attracting newcomers because that's something is, everyone is aware of this, everyone is right, using that, it. It might have been a low overhead or a low bar channel mm -hmm. for folks to participate with, sure. So I don't know, just a, a question we may have from time to time is, okay, uh, Linux kernel is using mailing list for the code review process and this sounds like something uh, not a low warrior, right? So you need some time to understand how this goes. First, understand how to produce something useful in the community. And the other is how to send uh, a, a code review process because they are using email, email, uh, mailing list. Mm -hmm. If we change the uh, data source they are using, can we reduce the barrier for newcomers? I don't know. But something we can, we can discuss. And perhaps we can try... Uh, looking for a specific use cases in certain communities. But this is this is what I wanted to, to address here. Like if we can look from an automated point of view, like these big jumps of activity, like this red or this yellow, it's something that it's something useful for the community. So can you okay, so I understand that makes sense. So in terms of the document, what on the quantitative, what is that most related to for you? Which of these, is it a country conversion funnel thing? I understand what you're talking about. I'm, and I can mm -hmm. try to help you articulate it. I'm just trying to see where it might locate the best. Yeah, probably, probably the first one, because what I was thinking about the conversion funnel is, uh, if we have this inverted pyramid, right? Which is the funnel yep. for, the, for the initial places to contribute and so on. And then we have like the developers or core developers at the end. Uh, at the top of our pyramid, inverted pyramid, what we'll have is this low barrier data sources. So it's like the place to look for these okay. entry places. You, you, I'm going to call it, I'll put data sources in there. Hmm. But I think from an engineering perspective, it's a data source. Maybe from a community perspective, it's a, a channel that people hmm. could participate with. So in the case of a mail list versus Slack versus IRC. Hmm. So is it possible to see increases in activity in certain communication channels? Oh, I remember, for instance, an example is uh, this talk by Kai Martin in Autodesk, uh, how they were able to foster collaboration in Autodesk because they, they started to use Slack. Uh -huh. so, Suddenly, they realized there was a good tool. Well, not they realized, but they started to use certain tool, and it was useful to say, "Hey, we are now collaborating." So suddenly, everyone is uh, producing things. So probably the number of messages increased a lot, right? Interesting. Okay. I think Kai has delivered the talk like at least a couple of times. I've seen him, but probably more. Something like something like that. From from what you were describing, you're just you're just trying to get that image of is there activity or unexpected high activity in 
data sources, what I'll call communication channels, just, but in these data sources, and is there anything that that can tell us? And it might be able to tell us that this was a data source or communication channel that allowed a lot of people to just kind of enter the conversation relatively quickly. Hmm. How we convert, how you take that, I think it was a pink, pink, pink bars that you were showing, how we convert that in this conversion funnel into long-term commitment is a, mm. a next the next question, but I think that's mm. what you're getting at. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for <laughs> putting no, into that sense. It's a great question. It's a great way of thinking about it. Okay, that's cool. Okay. So I'm glad we made some progress here. We have two minutes left. And I think we got through the strategies. <laughs> Mm. Yep, that's good. So next time we can focus solely on success metrics. Yep. Um, I do think there are many things in here that in and of themselves are metrics that we might want to tease out as separate metric pages in the future. But until we have more time, more experience with them, I think it's okay to have something like conversion funnel with some ideas. And then when someone actually goes out and implements a conversion funnel with metrics, then we can branch out, create a new page for this yep. by itself. That one seems super hard if I haven't mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, and then also, I guess, just in terms of where it would fit, um, where it, meaning onboarding, would fit um, in a focus area. To me, the most sensible one, um, maybe there are a couple. One is project and community. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Because the other two that are kind of closer, contributor community diversity, and that's it actually, contributor community diversity. And I think that's for existing contributors. Yeah. So that would be my recommendation, the yeah. seven focus area project and community. Yep, we have that at the top of the page already. Oh, you do? Okay. Bold it, so. Okay. I'll bold it. I see. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So okay. I think they're of one mind here. All right. Well, thank you for helping on the metric. Thank you for discussing. Uh, and welcome to our two newest board members as well. Oh, well, thank you. Daniel and Nicole and our... Ah. Our new co-director, Jorg. So yeah. Yay! This is, not, this is nothing but the heavy hitters on this call. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh. So, and just Daniel and Nicole, you know, give me a, a headshot, and I'm just going to use the bio that you. Yeah. Gave. But just yeah, to, yeah, here, I know I know that. Too. Set up on the web page. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Okay. okay. Have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye.